welcome to the program tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, disability, assistive technology, and computer interaction. David Jaffe, I've known for, uh, for I don't know, 40 years, I think. I met him in 1980. Um, he worked at the VA Rehab R&D Lab. Right. Um, the lab uh, survived for a long time. Now it's uh, part of a lot of development that goes on over there. But um, the um, he worked on was many disabilities things. You'll see some of some of them with him in a wheelchair, using just a head to control the wheelchair long, long ago. Um, and it's very interesting that you can use your head uh, to have gestures with other people and still control a, a, um, decouple what you do to, to work with a wheelchair. So very innovative guy. Now he's been teaching uh, for, for decades now at Stanford. Uh, at Stanford. And um, uh, as in, that, in that role, he, he puts on the disabilities class that has projects. You'll hear lots more about, about all of these things um, during his talk. And um, without any uh, further ado, I'm going to try to switch over to his slides. About um, uh, you know five topic areas about disability and assistive technology, uh, design process that the students um, use in my course, and uh, course description, some of their student projects, and some devices and products that um, are you know human computer interface type projects related to disability. So I'll. Uh, what is disability? So, you know, there's a lot of definitions depending on who's doing the defining and what kind of numbers they want. But, um, you know, my uh, definition is, is started as an opportunity-based uh, definition that defined as any, any health condition or impairment that prevents an indiv individual from taking full advantage of life's opportunities, such as education, vocation, recreation, and activities of daily living. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I updated my um, definition of disability to not just a health condition, but any condition that prevents any individual from taking full advantage of one's talents and life's opportunities, including circumstances such as uh, the political uh, environment and uh, social economic status. You know, for example, if you're on a planet that's under attack by the empire, right? You know, your your talent as a you know a classical pianist, you know, may not come into play. But you know, in, in closer to reality, um, in our, in Iran, you know, girls don't go to school after sixth grade. You know, they're barred from school. So just being a female gets you out of school. So does being a female is that a disability there? I, I would say so. But a more inclusive definition of disability comes from uh, my colleague, uh, Gregor, up in, up in Canada. And he says that disability is a normal variation of the human condition. Well, why should that be the case? Well, there's so many people with a disability, and, and you'll see that coming up, that um, you, know, you can't, they're not a minority in, anymore. So this idea of you know, this binary difference between able-bodied and disabled, you know, is, is, doesn't exist. So there is nothing, you know, akin to normal versus abnormal. And now we talk about a, a lot about uh, biodiversity, neurodiversity, the spectrum of autism. And also, you know, maybe there's a thing called ability diversity that goes along with this as well. And as, as the rock... And also, you know, uh, group. So, you know, here's a map of uh, the U.S. And uh, according to this, this data, there's 61 million adults in the U.S. with a disability, which is like 26 percent. So that's one in four. So that's hardly a minority. There are some, you know, people with some kind of disability. And it's, this is a slide that I use in class. So depending on, on how you count, there's millions of people in the U.S. with activity limitations. Um, and uh, which is, according to this, 23%. Um, and that varies depending on who's making the survey. There are millions of people with severe disabilities. Uh, children have disabilities. Healthcare costs related to disability is, is, is pretty high. Disability is the largest minority group. Uh, there's a lot of people that are over 65, including myself, that uh, might have a disability. There's people with vision impairments, hearing impairments, 
there are wheelchair users and people with developmental disabilities, but less than 5% of, of, of people are born with a disability. So it's acquired after birth. And when I have this slide at Stanford, um, I, I note that 12% of the Stanford students are registered with the Office of Accessible Education with some kind of disability, and it could include ADHD and, and other things. So it's, it's a big numbers all over. Um, disability rates vary by age, gender, race, and ethnicity, ethnicity um, state of residence and economic data status. So a person with a disability um, may have reduced chance for education and employment. And that's really critical because if you don't have an education, you can't get a job and can't make money. And so you're, you're living in, in poverty and that's not good at all. Um, and as people age, the number of people experience, experiencing limitations will, will increase. Okay. So people with disability, of course, want to be well and, and be fully functional. They want to have, want to do things on their own, have, uh, be independent, have a high quality of life and take full advantage of all of life's opportunities. And of course, pursue happiness and have the freedom to integrate, you know, fully into society or be a part of their own little group. It's, it's up to them. They have the freedom to do that. So I bring up this slide and everybody remember Matrix? Remember this scene where they said, you know, can you fly a B-212 helicopter? And what do they do? They stuck a probe back in, in the guy's head and within seconds, that information, that skill was transferred to that individual. If we can only do that now, <laughs> maybe we'd be better off. But there's actually people working on, on this, this kind of stuff. Um, you know, in society, we had, there's a lot of people with disabilities and they may be fictitious people. So my first person with a disability was Captain Hook and Pinocchio. And of course you have Quasimodo from the movies, you know, he went to uh, uh, Notre Dame, you know, which is in South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> right. And, um, and I guess being a pirate, you know, is pretty uh, dangerous because this, this guy has a hook and a peg leg and an eye patch. So that's, um, that's tough. And uh, Joseph Merrick, what, did, what was his name? The elephant man, right. And what was his condition? What was it? It's elephantitis. <laughs> 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 right. And then we have the, the munchkins. And, you know, be, beyond people, you know, there's animals with a disability. And there's actually been two films on this dolphin that they made a prosthetic tail for. Two, two movies. And of course, we got, uh, um, you know, from Harry Potter, King's Speech is, is a, a real movie about a, a person who stuttered. And then you know, we have Dr. Strangelove, obviously, you know, one of my favorite characters in a very old wheelchair. So it sort of permeates society. You know, here's some more people. And every year I add more to this list. So we got, we got Moses here. Uh, we got Helen Keller. We got Jay Leno. Um, we have uh, uh, Hitler. We have uh, Stephen Hawking. And of course, you know, the, the, the Daleks, you know, from Doctor Who, you recall, you know, this is, this is a, a, an alien who uh, needs protection. He can't, you know, walk outside. So they created an exoskeleton you know, for him, and an exoskeleton is assistive technology. Okay, so Slow down. there are whole people. Yeah, and some new in inductees includes uh, King Tut, who um, was. They did a scan of, of him, and they found that he had um, deformity of his left foot. And in his tomb, they found all sorts of canes, and there's even even carvings of him. And here's a recreation of him. So disability goes goes way back. And of course, even super, superheroes have a disability as you know, Superman and exposed to kryptonite. So we're superior than Superman in that respect in that we can be exposed to kryptonite and not have any ill effects, right? So let's talk a little bit about assistive technology. And of course the definition is the first thing. So people usually think of assistive technology as a device oriented uh, definition where it's, 
um, as any piece of equipment or product, whether acquired or commercially available or modified or customized that can be used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of individuals with, with disabilities. But my definition is obviously broader, which includes not only devices, but services and policies that benefit people with disabilities and institutions and facilities um, uh, where, where that work takes place and the process that makes it happen. Um, so an, an assistive technology device is one that has uh, a benefit, which could be a diagnostic benefit, a functional benefit, or a rehab benefit. And an, and an AT service provides various resources to people with disabilities. And of course, AT policies, laws, and legislation, you know, um, are things that mandate the provision of these devices and services, okay? And engineers employ um, an assistive technology process to specify, design, develop, test, and bring to market these new devices. So, um, so eight assistive technology devices then um, improve the quality of life and independence of people with disabilities by enabling them to perform tasks that they were formerly unable to accomplish or had a great deal of difficulty accomplish, accomplishing or required assistance through an enhanced alternate method of interacting with the world around them. That's, that's, that's pretty straightforward. But I realized that the devices that we use uh, improve the, our quality of life by the same, in the same reasonings, by enabling us to perform tasks that we were formerly unable to accomplish or had difficulty accomplishing or required assistance through an enhanced or alternate means of interacting with the world around us. So, so, so a couple, a couple more things before I get to the point here. Um, so there is new devices being developed all the time that um, further improve the lives of people with disabilities. And there are new devices incorporating novel designs that improve the life of everybody. So this leads me to conclude that everything is assistive technology, okay? Because, I mean, we're, we're okay, we're like cavemen, you know, without all, all this stuff, you know, we're pretty disabled, right? And so I mentioned, you know, computers and cars and airplanes and phones and electricity, hospitals and roads and stuff. And I, I asked my students, what's the most, most awesome piece of assistive technology? And the answer is Stanford University. Now, when I'm talking at Berkeley, you know, I substitute, you know, their logo in there because I don't want to get into too much trouble. Okay. Does everybody buy that? Okay. I mean, it's just a different way of thinking. So in summary, there's lots of people in, in the US and worldwide over a billion, um, you know, with, with a, a disability and uh, wheelchair users, you might think there being several million might be a homogeneous group of people because they all use wheelchairs. But it's not because every wheelchair user in, 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 um, that I've seen, you know, have, has different requirements, needs for their mobility and different preferences, goals in life and aesthetic preferences and different challenges. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that even though there's lots of people with disabilities and you might think that's a huge market to address, <laughs> it's actually fragmented down to the individual. And this was what makes provision of, uh, you know, products, uh, assistive technology project uh, products expensive and the companies that produce them are small. So, so that's this thing here. So, you know, because everybody is a little bit different, everybody, is an individual, whether they're disabled or not. But so that's so the point there is that um, it's hard to address the, this market because everybody has a little bit different disability. So how do you, how would you do that? So I brought the I created this concept called individual design. Um, so because individuals with disability have their own personal challenge that may only be addressed by a custom solution. So some of that examples of that are, you know, fitting the wheelchair, the wheelchair seating, prosthetics, uh, 
lap trays and devices to aid people with um, uh, in activities of daily living. And of course, a big thing that people have is the uh, sense of coolness of something. Everybody, um, there are so many decisions that people make unknowingly that, you know, for our clothes and stuff that said, you know, will this look cool, you know, for me, do I like this color on my car? Do I like this car because it looks cool and stuff like that? Everybody makes these decisions every day. So the coolness factor is actually a pretty important thing, not only in assistive technology, but um, in, in everyday life. So I'm, a little bit about the course that, so I've been teaching uh, this course for 18 years, it's called Perspectives in Assistive Technology. Um, and so the objectives for the students is for them to uh, gain additional engineering confidence, applying the knowledge and skills they have for other courses in addressing problems that people with disabilities experience. So uh, I try to focus on having the students do critical thinking and um, enhancing their communication skills, working as a team, interacting with individuals in the local community. And these are things that, um, that everybody needs to do. Um, the, these communication skills and working in a team and solving problems are things that everybody does on their job, right? So I try to give them um, uh, these kinds of skills in, in this class. Um, they certainly learn about the design, development, and use of technology that benefits people with disabilities and older adults. And they practice, you know, some leadership skills in their, in their team. Uh, so, the, you know, they're, they're given a problem, they have to analyze it, they have to do problem solving, they have to work in a team, they're working in the community, which is called public service, and it's also called service learning, and they go through a design process, which includes designing, fabricating, testing, analyzing, and, and iterating until uh, meeting, until they meet all the, the uh, design goals. And uh, they enhance their communication through reports presentations and class participation because nobody told me as an engineer when I went to school that communication skills were important, right? Did, did any of your instructors tell you that when you went to school? So, I mean, what did you think? That you as an engineer, you know, wouldn't have to do things like write reports or doing presentations or talking at Bay Chi? You know, they didn't know, right? So, I mean, it's really important. So, I mean, I, I focus on that in, in my class. And of course, you know, um, going, having uh, leadership skills on a team and organizing their project is really important. So, um, so my course is a little bit different. Um, there's no studying involved. There's no quizzes, no problem sets, no exams and finals or finals. So the students get graded on, on, on their reports their presentations and their project. Um, so we don't, there's no textbook. So remember when you were in school, you bought a textbook and say, today we're gonna do chapter three and on the back of the, the chapter, you're gonna do these problems, you know, for next class, you remember that? So none of that, that doesn't make any sense. So um, I bring in guest lectures so students don't hear my voice the whole time uh, because other people have better things to say. And, um, and I wanna get students excited about learning something that may have a more practical application that, than some of the courses that you took. I mean, think about all the courses that you took that you've never used anything from that. That's a lot of stuff, right? Never used, okay? Um, students don't need to learn how to study better and take exams. I mean, that's not something you do in a career, right? Okay. Um, and of course, I tell the students not to take notes, just to be attentive. So the course is about technology and people, assistive technology in, every, in many forms and going through this design development, development process I'll talk about, working on a project, engaging with uh, real people with real challenges. And I see that as a as a prelude to the, their professional life. Okay, so the course structure, it meets uh, twice a week and um, uh, I bring in guest lecturers to uh, talk about uh, various things. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
uh, there's opportunities for thought, uh, reflection and discussion, and uh, there's a project experience, uh, which includes identifying a challenge, understanding it, brainstorming solutions, uh, uh, designing prototypes, testing them, uh, reporting, and um, things that, that benefit a real person. I mean, how many, how many courses did you take that involve real people from the community? Prob anybody have any courses like that? Okay, so the students really like the course because of this, because it, you know, it makes sense. They're doing something that's uh, of obvious benefit to a real person. And uh, that makes it all, you know, real world rather than, you know, imaginary in my mind. So uh, I talked about the project experience that includes working with uh, a person in the community um, in prototyping solutions and testing it with them to make sure that it works and going th through an iterative cycle till they get to the end of the, the course. And, um, and we have uh, midterm and end of term reports and presentations. And at the very end, we have project demonstrations that I'll show you some pictures from. So the students have an opportunity to employ the skills that they already have. Um, and some of the students in the class may not be engineers, but that's okay, because there's lots of support for them uh, in building stuff. So projects uh, are not just about, you know, building things, it's building people, building character. Um, and you can um, sometimes attack a challenge by, um, by starting with the challenge or maybe starting with the technology. If you have a new technology, you can say, hey, you know, this might really work, you know, solving this other problem. And that was the situation with lasers. You know, nobody knew, you know, how beneficial lasers would, would be. Who knew that you can play music <laughs> with lasers, right? So that's really important. So um, I, I focus on, um, you know, a 10 week project. Uh, so that what the students come up with is a prototype that's functional that uh, benefits that individual. But I don't focus at all on commercialization because number one, we're working with one person and that a solution for that one person may not extrapolate into a solution for other people. Because like I said, everybody is, is different. So going through this design process is really um, important. So here are some of my guest lectures. A lot of these people I, I work with uh, are from people that work at the two other, three other professors at Stanford, um, a, a PhD candidate that's doing brain computer interface. Um, an occupational therapist and a uh, design person and a student um, who actually commercialized her student project way back when. Okay. So those are, so I model each class session after the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So I, I get, I get up and I do my monologue, you know, for like 10 or 15 minutes and then we have a little break and then the guest lecture uh, uh, comes on and, and talks about um, you know, these interesting topics. So, um, yeah. So Peter here is um, a, um, a person who's a wheelchair user. And it turns out he was the first full-time student at Stanford who used a wheelchair. And uh, so he's done some fantastic things in the area of disability, adaptive sports and, and stuff. Um, and so he goes through like 200 slides <laughs> in in uh, in an hour and uh he's because i have him every year he becomes he became so proficient at doing this so i i bring back the same this the same guest lectures because uh, they get better every year although i sometimes i have new people and then i have people from the community who suggest projects either for themselves or their clients um and um uh, this is a group of people who wanted to um, uh, somehow use uh, robotics in dance. And, uh, but uh, nobody took that, took on that project. Uh, extra topics are, are, are meant to be interesting, things that stu students had never heard about before. 
like brain computer interfaces, like exoskeletons, like prosthetics, like adaptive sports, um, like, um, 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 uh, like low tech assistive technology, uh, stuff like that. So um, it's all, I, I hope it's interesting to the students. So now I'll go through some of this project. And this is from about three weeks ago. This is at the, at the last class session um, where the students um, are given a table outside and set up their projects. And uh, um, I go around with my course assistant and we evaluate the functionality of every device. And um, I'm eating a burrito here. I bring in burritos for everybody. So it's, it's a very low key trade show like atmosphere. Um, and the students get to see um, uh, the other the other projects and get to ask questions and we just have a lot of fun. And here's some of the things they worked on. So we work with the Magical Bridge Playground um, and they're always looking for new additions to their park. The Magical Bridge Playground um, is a, a playground that was designed from the bottom up to be accessible and inclusive and that resulted in a playground that is so totally different than you know an ADA compliant playground. And so it's it's actually set a new standard by just you know wiping out what everybody else has done. So students are imagining imagining you know other devices in in there, including a device that they can uh, open up and tech, feel the textures, move things around. And this could be made really you know big and may provide a shelter at the bottom of to um, um, to start off their project. Okay. So uh, Sylvia is a wheelchair user who uses uh, a uh, catheter, and so the students wanted to do a make a custom bag for her that uh, looked looked aesthetically good, and it was supposed to have artistic expression on it. Um, and that didn't happen really well, and the students had a tough job sewing it, but uh, it worked out fine. Sometimes it, it, they get more more benefit from you know working with the person than actually coming up with with this the, their their device. So here's here's a, a high tech device. So this is for Danny, who has a service dog, and Danny is a person who's a wheelchair user. He has uh, limited vision and grasp um, and has cerebral palsy and the service dog um, um, sleeps in this kennel at night but he has a problem you know unlatching the door and opening it up so it doesn't interfere with his wheelchair so this, so that's a challenge that I identified and so the students came with it up with a device that they hit this button uh, this there's a computer in here that unlatches that has a servo motor that unlatches the the, the latch here and a stepper motor that opens the door and it just works perfectly. And it's also available by uh, uh, through Alexa so we can uh, command it by voice to open. So, I mean, there's no device like this on the market. There were, there were a couple of similar devices, but they're off the market. And here's another uh, solution for, for Danny. So everybody who uses a wheelchair has problems with um, storage, you know, where to put things. And so um, this team worked on a, uh, a bag that fits on the side of the wheelchair that's easily accessible. And since Danny has a problem, you know, grabbing a zipper, they use this adaptive uh, opening device so he can easily uh, work it. This was an awesome lap tray that uh, students made. Every Every person who uses a wheelchair needs to have a surface, you know, to put their stuff on, whether it's a laptop or, um, you know, food or laundry in this case. And this turned out to be really good. So that it's, it's hard to see the details, but this lap tray splits in the middle and it sort of, it sort of uh, folds in on itself. And so it, it opens, it, it's able to be removed once you fold it up um, and once you you put it in, it has clamps along the side that, that uh, clamp against the uh, armrests. So it's, it's a, sort of a new design that I've never seen before. And it was made to be, you know, fit him exactly. So that was really good. 
So this is the other project for the Magical Bridge Playground. And the students went there and they saw the playground littered with cardboard. And so the, the kids use cardboard to go down the slide faster or down the, uh, uh, down the hill that the slide is on. And so uh, they did that from day one. And so the students said, oh, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So they came up with a couple of designs for um, the, the sleds. And here's me on there. And I'm telling you, you know, going down the slide when you're older is, is very scary, as you can see, as you can see here. But uh, that's that. And, and, you know, I had to do it just to give students a laugh. Um, oh, sled. Sorry? The slide sled. Slide sled. Okay, that's a good name for it. So, um, a, a storage solution for Abby, who's a wheelchair user, and the issue there with her is that she has multiple wheelchairs, and so to make a storage system that only fits on one, you know, wouldn't you know, it would be good. So they came up with a design with two pieces, and this piece folds into the slot here on the other side, and that is around the armrest. So that works for for three wheelchairs and two scooters. So that was a good design. And they picked out some very colorful material and sewed it up. Um, this is for um, Abby's service dog, Nathan. And anybody that has a, a dog that they train knows that when the dog does something good, you're supposed to give them a treat immediately. Well, for Abby, she has the treats in her, in her backpack, on the back of the wheelchair, and she has issues with her hands, and it takes a while for her to get the treats out and do and and uh, and provide it. So the students 3D printed um, this device, and all she has to do is rotate this knob, <laughs> and, and treats will come out. And there's actually the clicker on it, so the clicker indicates to the dog that to expect a reward. So they start salivating and looking forward to a reward. So that that worked out really good. Um, and from last year, students made this sort of pinball machine for the playground. Um, so if you have a service dog, the dog needs to be fed and hydrated. So this year we worked, at, we worked on, on the design for uh, this system. So this is a reservoir. And when Danny presses the reservoir, uh, water comes up into the bowl. And the dog on the first day knew that that was water for him to drink. So that was like a really easy solution. A lot of these solutions, you know, can be, you know, really simple. So, um, yeah. And they also came up with a holder for him so that, you know, he has a hard time seeing and placing things. So they 3D printed this thing that would ease the, um, the iPhone into the cradle. And this is a holder for it for, it, for the iPhone. So that's a recharging station. Uh, this is another playground attraction, and the students are using this clay material that when um, when wet, it produces a, a dark image. So that could be something that students can use repetitively in the playground to draw things. But, you know, the use of water, you really don't have water in, in a playground. So um, that's sort of problematic. Uh, this is a, a team that worked on... Um, uh, a dog leash system for Corey. Uh, Danny, again, has really trouble with his hands. He can't operate the, the, the buckle. Uh, and so the students came up with a mag magnetic attachment. So oh, there's a bunch of magnets in here and on the leash and on the, on the dog. So all the students have to do is, is uh, all, the, all Danny has to do is put the leash onto this and then attaches. And by uh, sort of twisting it, um, it unattaches. So, and that was done by a team of students with no engineering background at all, but they were able to do it. So uh, Mary is a student who has a prosthetic leg and I always thought it'd be a neat idea to, you know, dress up that prosthetic leg. Uh, I wanted to have the students work on something that would, you know, light up as, as she walked or as, uh, as she danced or to the music and stuff. But, Mary just wanted something that, you know, looks a little bit different. So, so here's something that is easily laced onto her prosthetic leg that she can, you know, decorate in a fashion uh, that, she, that she likes. So um, 
this is this is <laughs> the lower leg of cat and her dog okay and cat had this uh issue uh with um nerve damage in her shin and she liked to go to concerts but the music caused pain so the students were given the task you know find something that would attenuate the sound so she wouldn't have pain in and sure enough, they found something, and it turned out to be um, acoustic insulator made for um, for cars, where you have the big, you know, boombox speakers in it. So they bought this thing, you know, for fifteen dollars and made it into a sleeve, and it worked great. So uh, that was that was neat. Okay, who remembers this 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 dog? Okay, okay, it's from Up. And what was the dog's name? Doug, right. So remember the collar that Doug wore? What did, what did what did it do? It allowed him to speak English. Yeah, so it was a brain computer interface that allowed him to vocalize what he was thinking. So we did sort of the same thing in class, but not it's not a brain computer interface. So everybody that has a service dog has this problem where people see the dog and they say, Oh, it's a dog. And it's, it's just something uh, uh, I need to get my dog fixed. I need to uh, go up to the person and say, oh, what a cute dog. You know, what's his name? How old is he? How much does he weigh? And of course, the dog, a service dog is working. And so you're disrupting the service dog's, you know, work ethic. So, you know, what the owner has to do is say, don't disturb the dog. He's working. You know, don't distract him. And every time, you know, she's out. You no, know, there's, you say it again and again and again. So what this thing does, this is a, just a Bluetooth speaker, and this is a bunch of switches with a Bluetooth in interface. And when it does, when you press the button, it sends an MP3 over Bluetooth. And so you can have the dog say anything you want. You can say it in the owner's voice or a presumed dog's voice and stuff. So, you know, uh, so this, <laughs> This actually uh, was awarded second place in the student design competition this past year. So that was really, yeah. But, you know, you, I mean, you have to identify these problems. So here's Abby again, and uh, she has a special wheelchair, and uh, you wanted, she wanted a, a place to put her laptop because she goes out for coffee and wants to work on her Macintosh computer and have the mouse there and have it. Um, the ability for it to uh, break down so she can put it in the in the in her backpack so those were the design criteria so the students came up this this really nice piece of acrylic and some pvc piping that fits um under her her cushion um on, on her wheelchair and so it's, it's very easy to use and uh, these guys that were on this team were all athletes and they, that's what they came up with um so that was that was really neat so um, in summary, the course is one that focuses on building confidence, enhancing professional skills. You know, we go on a field trip to the Magical Bridge Playground. We have the lectures, we have the projects. I have an assistive technology fair where I bring in uh, companies and services related to disability and assistive technology. And we sort of have a, you know, a trade show atmosphere. And, um, this was actually one thing that worked really good over Zoom on COVID because I put each vendor in a different breakout room and the students just went from one breakout room to another. Uh, this year I was a little worried because we only had like five vendors, but that gave students a lot more time to spend at each table and it worked out really, really well. Um, okay. Um, the students also reflect on their experience um, and so, you know, again, assistive technology benefits everybody. Everybody benefits. We use assistive technology every every day. Does that mean we're disabled? Well, I mean, we're not, you know, a, a, super, a superhero like Superman would say, you know, you, you guys can't even fly. You know, you're, you're that disabled. You can't even fly. But, um, but um, yeah. Okay, what else do we got here? Uh, I want to just go a little bit through this design process uh, that we use in the class. And, uh, you know, so these are slides that I, I use. So the process is a step by step plan, plan of action. 
um, employed by the students to achieve their goal. And, and, and using it as a structured way increases the chances of success. And, and of course, students respond to, re respond to getting good grades. So there's lots of design processes. And at Stanford, the D school has um, design thinking that has all these hexagons, which um, you know, they promote as being um, a, um, a general um, design process that, you can, that anybody can use in any context, but that it doesn't work in my class. Um, and these are some other named um, processes. And it's, at Northwestern, they, they, their process is called whole brain engineering. So, I mean, that's different, different. So, you know, there's lots of activities in the design process. And the one I want to focus on is, is the problem and challenge. So basically, you know, what I do in the class is I search for these challenges and problems. I identify them. I describe them. I, I make up a description that's on the website um, and um, um, that the students can review before, um, uh, before the problems are pitched to the class on the second day of class. But the most important part of this, which I haven't seen enunciated in any of these design process is to understand the problem, okay? I mean, it's just super obvious to me, the more you understand about the problem, the better the solution you'll come up with. And all these other design processes, I've never seen this mentioned. So it's, it's really important. So you need to understand the problem to determine what is needed. So you need to have this knowledge that you can use to brainstorm ideas that would solve that. I mean, to me, that's, it's just so obvious. And of course, you need to understand, incorporate what the user uh, says. And so you, the students have to go in and interview the user, observe them, observe the, the challenge, um, you know, talk to them and see, you know, they even go to the, the, um, um, the community partners you know, home to see the challenge in context, okay? And of course, you know, I encourage students to go on the internet, see what else is available, David, talk to experts. David, um, in terms of uh, observing, yes. what, what do you think the trade-offs are in being the, uh, the user? In other words, uh, being, not, 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 not interviewing them, not observing them as an anthropologist, but actually <laughs> uh, modeling them, being, you know, acting, you know, taking on their persona? No, um, uh, we don't use personas in the class because personas are imaginary people. And I want to make sure that they talk to a real person that has a real challenge that can be enunciated and observed, you know, through, through observation and interviewed to get a sense of, of the person and what their goals are and things like that. And that's, that's really important because, I mean, that's the customer. And in my course, you know, it's the only customer. They only work to solve the problem of that one person. Because even though there's lots of people with the disability to say, build something that will help, you know, 10,000 people with this disability, how are you gonna, you know, get background from 10,000 people? It's, and, you know, also considering that everybody with a disability is pretty much an individual. So to make things simple for the student, um, you know, we work with that one individual. And I don't care about the commercialization part of it because I couldn't fit that into a 10-week course to begin with. And, um, you know, making something, making a commercial prod, product is something that may take years and millions of dollars. And I don't have that kind of funding for the class and most of the time it's not going to be successful. So going through this process for one person is sufficient for the class. That's what I've come up with. So you have to understand the, 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 the person. I don't like the term empathy because empathy is like this, knowing exactly how somebody feels. But what we want is to, to um, include the desire to um, um, address the problem. Okay, and that's called, called compassion. So you, the students have to find out as much as you can about the user's background, about the disability condition, and um, 
solicit, you know, information from family members, other healthcare professionals, um, and, and um, um, you know, talk to other people. And so here's a couple of slogans I've come up with um, to describe this process. The user will have a very good handle on what the problem is and what their challenges are, but he or she may not be a designer or an engineer, so they not, may not fully appreciate the benefits and limitations of technology, okay? So there's two groups of people here. There's the students, and then there's the user, and then there's me, okay? So everybody has a little bit different role in there. So since each person has their own circumstances, desire, and sense of aesthetics, the solution for one user may not be applicable for the pop entire population. Now there's a slogan in assistive technology that says, solve for one and extend to many. But I don't think that works in with people with disability because of these differences in 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 each individual. So I so uh, again, I'm not interested in commercialization at all. Can okay. ask another question? Yes, you you brought up that topic that it's you design for one person several times. Yeah, um, that is kind of in uh, contrast, you might say, to the whole idea of universal design. Which is make make things that work for every, uh, for disability and will help everybody, uh, and I can think of many examples of that. I've even made many examples of right. that. And, and you're not focusing on that because you just don't believe in it, or because you think it's a stronger point of view yeah. and more helpful to your designers. Well, the issue here is uh, universal design is a very important concept, but it's things that best work when there's a shared resource when there's a building that needs to be accessible for everyone, um, where um, the internet has to be accessible because a lot of people with disabilities use it. But when you talk about a device for an, an individual, something that uh, it, it's, it's, it's different, um, universal design isn't, it's not required if, you, if, it's, if it's something that just that one person uses, okay? Is, is that, Answer your problem or not? No, I don't want to belabor it. I just want to say point out that um, a lot of um, a lot of people use. Well, when Apple made a bunch big, a really serious effort in the disability uh, package, um, and I went to the you know American Federation for the Blind, yeah, they had this huge room full of assistive devices, and they said all of these are worse than this iPhone now, and so I think it's very exciting when people make something that's a tool that many, many people can use. And I think it's possible. And so that's, you know, that doesn't mean that your, your, your point that working for an individual isn't valuable. I just can think of places where universal design has been help, right. helpful. Yeah, for a product, you want that because that one product is going to be a shared product for lots of people. But a lot of times it doesn't work that way that a, an individual may... Um, uh, that may not help a specific individual or may have to be customized for that individual. So just to blow my own horn, the track point yeah. was useful in many, many different ways for people with disability that I hadn't anticipated. Right. And, um, you know, I could go into that in detail, not here. But um, so that that's kind of exciting when you make something that that actually right. can, can is flexible enough and powerful enough in its own ways that it gets used by many right. people. Right. That's all. Okay, I, I'll, I'll agree with that. Okay. Okay. Oh, so part of understanding the problem is going through catalogs and uh, reviewing um, uh, other literature. And um, the things, the questions that students <clears throat> should be asking is, <clears throat> are there products on the market already that uh, sort of address this problem? And if there are, you know, what are the most commonly used which one are commonly used? Um, what is considered standard? Um, you know, and the, and sometimes is you know why aren't the products that are on the market solutions? Why do people still need something? So those are all questions to ask. So you build on the, on existing solutions, but and this is my top level slogan. So I used to say sometimes. The only problem is a lack of awareness of a suitable existing solution. Um, but now I say most of the time. So 
if you're a person with a disability, um, you may, you probably don't know what's out there because you're just one person and you're not on the internet. But, uh, you know, an uh, occupational therapist or a rehab engineer might have a, a broader view. And when somebody approaches me with a, a challenge, the first thing I'll do is I'll go online and, and Google something. And most of the time, I get pages and pages of possible solutions. And to me, it's, it's, it's terrible to um, copy something that's already available. It's a waste, waste of time and money. So I, I always make sure that these challenges um, are, um, have, uh, will have a, a, a unique solution that they are, aren't already addressed in their entirety. So, so some of the reasons why current solutions don't work, they may cost a lot of money, they may weigh a lot, they may be unreliable, ineffective, um, the student that the users may not use them for one reason or another because it may be a poor aesthetics or they don't function uh, specifically for that individual. They, um, again, may not fit that individual uh, or it may not take care of current technology. But I had a, a person who said, who we made a custom made walking stick for. And it had like, we, we took her a, a, a mold of her grip and they 3 d printed that and we made, a, you know, got a, a custom, uh, uh, cane colored it and it's nice. And she, and she said, you know, I, I, I have this cane that I made that has duct tape on it. And I actually like that better. <laughs> so you, you, you can't tell sometimes people like what they're using better. Okay. Judge the need. So, you know, a lot of times people talk about need finding and to me, that's not the right term because need is a judgment in my mind. Okay. And so you only, can judge what's needed by having knowledge of a full knowledge of the problem, a full understanding of the problem. Okay. You can't start brainstorming until you have this knowledge. Okay. And this is what the D school thinks of as brainstorming using a lot of post-it notes. Um, so, um, so there's all, all sorts of techniques for doing brainstorming. So the idea is to come up with lots of ideas and I tell people to think of wild ideas and they're not done until they cross over to the other side of, of, of um, the laws of physics and, and stuff like that and talk about, you know, really weird things because at that point, you know, your mind is open to, to new kinds of ideas. Don't get stuck on the original idea. I had a student who all she wanted to do was brainstorm. So every new person she met was another opportunity for brainstorming. And she filled up like two sketchbooks, you know, brainstorming ideas. You just got to move past that. If you're in a process, you have to go through the process and you can't get stuck. And there may be technology out there that you can apply to your, uh, the current problem. So this is Henry Evans, and he's using this laser pointer to point to an alphabet board because he's a non-vocal individual. Um, and uh, so that worked out really great. Other people um, use the um, um, Google Glass as a, because they're, they're a photographer with a disability. Um, so there's all sorts of things that are on the market that could be adapted for people with disability. Uh, students, you know, obviously need to talk to the person that they're working with um, and observe the problem and challenge, encourage them to tell the story about what they do, how they live, um, about how they do things. And so the understanding that sh they should have from that is to understand what a solution should do, but maybe it's too early, too early to say how it should work. And, and an underrated design feature is coolness. Everybody, you know, needs, wants to look cool, even people with disabilities and older adults. So when you come up with lots of ideas, you put it in a pew chart, a spreadsheet, and one of the factors besides all the, the design concepts is coolness. So it has to be cool. That has to be checked off. Okay. And students need to interact with the, that person with every prototype they make. 
so they get feedback and suggestions so they can refine their design. Um, so the design process does not include building to somebody else's blueprint um, or making incremental improvements on things. Um, students who work in a class, um, um, you know, they have resources from um, uh, the course resource people in the product realization lab. There's 24 graduate students who can assist them. Their classmates can help them. And of course, I, I help them as well. But the students have to make and justify all their own uh, project decisions. You know, why did you do that? So um, to, to summarize, Assistive technology is a highly fragmented market. A small market means that there's uh, high prices for the products and um, the companies are small. And so if they're, they're, they're working on a bunch of prototypes and I tell them, you know, your first prototypes are, are going to fail and they're not going to work, you should anticipate that. You should start out working with low resolution materials, making something quick to get an idea because once you need to have it in 3D form because that's how your brain works in 3D. You can turn things over and point to things and stuff. So that's what I encourage. Before you, before you move on to the slide, I just had a question. Yeah. So um, first of all, the, the best part of the presentation for me was the student projects. Yeah. I really appreciated that. Yeah. So so thank you for shepherding the young minds to to achieve what they what they did because I'm, I'm sure that had, a, had an impact. Um, but on a previous slide, you say, a small market means high prices. And then on the other hand, you say that up to one in four individuals in the US right. have disabilities. Right. So I go to this conference every few years. I can't make it every year. What's it called? At, at CSUN. Yes, I, North I was at the first 25 of them. Exactly. So, so it is the place to go and learn about assistive technology and accessibility. And I talked to an inventor over there. I had run into him accidentally. And he told me, you know, I'm really frustrated because the assistive technology is really amazing, but the people who have disabilities are usually underemployed. They cannot afford it. The prices are too high. Yeah. So what are the solutions? Number one, you could say, okay, government assistance, fine. You know, we need a safety net. Fine. Let's do that. Second thing is maybe technology gets cheaper. Third thing, actually like what you had said, which is universal design. Maybe the fact that Apple, you know, gave a toss and 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 put accessibility in from the get go right. into the device helps everybody, including people with disabilities. And because it was such a mass produced product, it helped everybody diffusion right. of innovation. Right. right. So uh, what, what is your answer to this right. challenge where you have people who cannot afford it yet they need it? How oh. do you cross that? Right. Um... I, I think that the solution is outside of engineering, perhaps. So you talked about economics. Yeah, yeah it's, it's economics. So at, in the in the VA, they have a um, they have a policy where they'll provide anything that a, a veteran with a disability needs, including a hundred thousand dollar prosthetic arm and probably exoskeletons, and they'll modify a van for a, a wheelchair user. The, the, the user buys a van and the VA will pay for any modifications. So that's sort of the top end of, of insurance. But how do you, but, you know, places like, um, you know, Medicare, um, you know, they are at the end or other end of the spectrum as far, as far as provision of this. In fact, they'll only provide one wheelchair for a person and don't, and, and it's only an indoor wheelchair. They, they think a person with a disability um, is not gonna be working and doesn't need. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a long-term issue there. Did you give me a speed yes. up? Okay. Um, so uh, the, the final thing is just going through some devices and products that, you know, that um, are out there. And maybe I'll, um, I'll go through these pretty quickly. So this is a device I did in uh, early 80s, probably. And it's for people uh, like this who, have, who are quadriplegic. 
And so she's using um, a tilt and space wheelchair, a power wheelchair that had a joystick on it. Well, she can't use the joystick. So, so what do you do? So I, I developed a system in this box here that has an 8-bit Z80 processor in it and connected it up to a couple Polaroid ultrasonic sensors that monitor the head position. So it will tell, it will <laughs> sense, you know, when, how far you've tilted your head and in what direction. So I use that as control inputs. And so your head has become the top of the joystick and it's wireless, you wear nothing. And so this is a long time ago. Um, I have a little bit of a video here, but I'm not sure it's gonna play and probably don't have time, but you can see how old this is. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is a, a robotic hand that does finger spelling, which is a subset of sign language that represents letters. And everybody knows that this, this is V for victory and there's other letters. So uh, when somebody is doing sign language, when they come to a word for which there's no two-handed gesture, they spell it out. So uh, what I've created here was a a hand that has a bunch of servos in it that moves each finger in response to pre key presses on, on a keyboard. So it, it basically moves each, each finger appropriately. Yeah, so this is me. Notice my head tilting. And so you can see how old this, this um, video is because this, is, this was before I started dyeing my hair gray, <laughs> right? Okay, everybody see that? Did that get out there? Okay, well. Yes, it did play. Okay. It just had no sound. The video is not playing through the Zoom link, through the Zoom video meeting. Oh. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is a a robotic hand that does finger spelling, which is a subset of sign language that represents letters. And everybody knows that this, this is V for victory and there's other letters. So uh, when somebody is doing sign language, when they come to a word for which there's no two-handed gesture, they spell it out. So uh, what I've created here was a, a hand that has a bunch of servos in it that moves each finger in response to pre key presses on, on a keyboard. So it, it, it basically moves each, each finger appropriately.
but we'll move on from that. I worked on a driving simulator, and the idea here is to um, assess the driving abilities of people post-stroke without having them actually driving in a car um, and uh, possibly training them to drive better after a stroke. So these are, this is a commercial device. This is a bunch, a bunch of buttons that can be programmed for a specific action on a computer, moving the cursor, opening a, um, a program and things like that. So these are on the market. This is another thing on the market. This is a, a Glidance Glide system. So this is a device that, um, you, that a person who's blind can use to, to seek out the free Uh, produced. There's many versions of this that have been done over the years. So um, this is like nothing, nothing new, but it's, I mean, it's a new product, but um, um, this is just a reincarnation of a long line of its existing products that do the same thing, including, you know, robot guide dogs, uh, things like that. Okay, this is the Voltrex type and talk. Who remembers this? Okay. This is 1981. I had one of these, and this had a serial port, and you just said to it, and it would and it would speak it. Um, so that was that was really neat. But another version uh, called the Deck Talk. Who, who knows about this? This was was uh, even better because it had various voices in it, and it had telephone connection. Um, and so with this system, I actually made a, a dial-up website, audio website. You can dial in and using the touch that is doing these days. So the, you know, that's, that's it. I hope I haven't gone over time or got you too bored or whatever. But if you have any. Yeah, well, I want to start with um, Alec. I um, uh, had a question online. Um, can you unmute and speak for yourself or I will uh, speak your question myself? I'll, I can just come over there and yell. Well, I just wanted to ask it if you want. I guess I can. I oh, can have... Go ahead. Are, are, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, uh, great talk. Thank you so much for sharing all this. This this is uh, um, it's really good. So my question is, um, um, from your perspective, as robotics evolve and they become highly intelligent and mobile, uh, which seem to be coming up um, relatively soon, maybe not in our lifetime, but uh, relatively soon, do you think... Or maybe. Yeah, well, go ahead. Um, robotics helping disabled in all kinds of different ways. Uh, um, and, and, uh, on, are you, you okay? Know, you good help on their behalf. Do you do you think question or I can read it for you? Yeah. Do you do you do you think uh, that's going to introduce new issues um, or it's going to be a lifesaver for many? People? Yeah. Uh, after my question, it completely went. Um, quiet. So maybe you'd like to re-answer it. I'm sorry about that. Well, I, I think uh, technology will advance and there will be applications um, that would be uh, more workable for, for people with disabilities. Um, but they, there may have to be specialized robots for certain things. You know, there may be, you know, a robot for cooking, another one for, you know, toileting or, or um, getting food and stuff like that. So Maybe multiple multiple robots, uh, specifically designed for uh, uh, specific applications, might be the answer. Yeah, um, I, I think part of the question that I, I saw online was okay. was um, the issue of when we start having AI um, answering with ChatGPT and stuff like that. Um, when it takes over for a person, um, is that do they lose agency? And when does it cause problems and when does it solve problems? Right. It depends on what the, the robot is meant to do. If it's meant to be a, a caregiving robot and assist the person, then maybe there's no issue. But it's another thing to have it speak for that individual or act for that individual. So that's something completely different. So at this point, I, I don't know if some people that haven't asked questions, I've been asking if you um, want to ask something or it's getting a little late. Um, and and you know maybe maybe that'll be close to the end. But um, does any of, any of you guys want to may add, to the, add to the commentary at all, please? No. Is it okay. Oh, Larry. I mean, uh, Pete. 
Uh, Pitlin here from other lab. Uh, just wondering a little bit about um, neural diversity and um, with uh, in very specific ways. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't hear him though. Oh, sorry. What diversity he's asking. <clears throat> uh, okay, I'll just use my voice. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering a little bit about neural diversity and whether or not, obviously, different people have different things that they're strong at, other things that they're weak at. I mean, whether or not we will be able to directly compensate for these things. Right. In, in yeah, this is a big issue. I mean, I, I've always thought that everybody has something to contribute, even if it's a person with Down syndrome or uh, somebody with autism, uh, everybody has something to contribute. So um, making that contribution happen through assistive technology or robots or brain computer interfaces is something to look forward to. Um, Ted Tucker again. Um, yeah, I. I actually think that um, even when you take a very small population, even when you when you think you are you know selecting for certain kinds of people, it turns out the full diversity of of problems and and creatives and people that are good at doing you know in rote work come out of the, uh, in the, in the population. And I think maybe it's because these different abilities that people have are 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 useful in different situations. And uh, actually, that diversity is kind of what makes us more viable. Right. I, I know that there are vocational training programs specifically for, for people with autism. And um, 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 so, you know, you know, everybody c can be a contributor. I've seen some awful great artwork and music produced by people with disabilities. Um, great writing. I, there's a a number of students at Stanford with disabilities, and they all write for the Stanford Daily, and, and they're um, they're just awesome. Um, so I see potential and contribution in, in everybody. So so with that, um, uh, Dave, so you've uh, been very 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 broad discussion. You've given us an understanding of of uh, disabilities in general, and also what you teach in your classes, but, but more importantly, a lot of different examples across a large spectrum, really more, more mechanically oriented, not, not so much software in your, in your examples. Um, and uh, so my last question is, um, and, then, and then we'll probably have to call it a night very, very soon, yeah. um, is uh, what do you think of um, the possibility of your class taking on more software projects? And what do you think the, the reasons that it might be more fun to stay with yeah. a mechanical or, or, or move over to. Right. I, I have had software projects in the past, but I, I really enjoy when people create something physical. Okay. But I'm not adverse to uh, so software, but I, I like, I like, I like devices a lot. I, I like, you know, the hands-on buildings of, of things. But you can imagine a course yeah. that is all, it's all about AI and interaction. Well, and not that well, you're, we'll not say. your class, not your class. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. Um, I, I do um, have an, a small AI component in, in the course. When students are trying to understand the problem, I ask them to ask AI about what kinds of solutions AI might have. And I have the students comment on those responses. And so there was uh, three teams that, that, that uh, went through that exercise. Um, uh, but before we go, I want to just give my uh, email address. It's um, Dave Jaffe at stanford.edu. And my the course website is engr110.stanford.edu. And if anybody's around campus during the winter quarter, they're welcome to sit in on the class. <laughs>